check, mic check, 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 check. All right, we're gonna take a pivot. Thank you guys, uh, that was an awesome talk. But today, I am going to pivot you into some edutainment. That's right, we're gonna get some brain hooks here into the world of mushroom intelligence. I wanna take you on a journey. So, let's just see how this thing works. Down the rabbit hole. Just like Alice in Wonderland, we're gonna go deep down the rabbit hole. Now, most of you, when you think of mushrooms, you know of this kind of psychedelic landscape, but you don't know about these medicinals. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But this is what I really wanna to talk to you about. But this is where we come from. Really, this sensory gate expansion. The thing about mushrooms that we don't, um, a lot of us have mycophobia, which is really this fear of mushrooms because they just pop up in the middle of the night, like other things. Anyway, this is what we know about mushrooms. We know about the psychedelics, this mind-expanding world where the mushrooms um, have shown people ways to find deeper aspects of themselves. We call this sensory gating channels to change the channels, to pivot the gates in which we see the world from. So this is what people know of. We also have heard of the Amanita, right? The emoji mushroom on your phone. You know this mushroom? Yeah, that's the one on your phone, the little mushroom. This is uh, one of the most famous mushrooms, uh, known as the mushroom of the flying reindeer people. Yes, the flying reindeer people. This is where our story of Santa Claus comes from, where Christmas comes from. And really, in the Siberian part of the world, at solstice, at winter solstice, when the darkest day came, they would celebrate that to bring back the light by consuming these mushrooms to expand their way of seeing. Now, we're not gonna talk about this too much, but literally, these reindeer eat this mushroom, concentrated in their urine, the shamans eat their urine, and they go to the head of God, so to speak. They also come down the chimney because uh, in this winter time, the door would be covered with snow. So they come down the chimney and they bring people presents. That's right, a state of presence. But we're not gonna talk about that either. We're gonna really dive deeper into the wood wide web. That's where I wanna share with you today. That's my biggest passion, is exploring nature's intelligence. I'm a herbalist from Vancouver Island, and I really speak on deepening our connection to the natural world. I spend a lot of time out in the forest. I probably harvest a few hundred pounds of mushrooms every year. But what really gets me is this intelligent design in nature, and I feel as though we, can learn a lot from this. One of the biggest things we've learned is how trees, just like humans, nurse their young by sending through the mycorrhizal connections between the mushrooms and the tree. Every tree builds nutrition coming from these mycorrhizal connections. So it's this collaborative aspect of reciprocity, this symbiosis that we see between the trees and the mycelial networks. We also realize that actually we think of trees as holding the carbon banks of our planet. Well, underground in the mycelial networks is the real bank. There's more carbon sequestered underground in the mycelial networks than there are in the trees. And they transfer this information back and forth. We see trees have the ability to recognize their young and send nutrition through the mycelial nets to nurse the young baby Doug firs coming up. They'll be able to preferentiate that between other trees. But then the mycelial networks know that they need a symbiotic environment in which everyone flourishes, and the more biodiversity, the more stable the environment becomes. So what they do is they send this nutrition all through to the many different aspects of the forest. Mycelium has been on this planet since before the edge of time. And one of my favorite practices is getting out into the forest. There's two ways these mushrooms can heal us. This is a chaga mushroom right here. And there's two ways it can heal us. One is using it as medicine, and I'm gonna teach you a little bit about that today, but also the other one is getting out into the forest and releasing our tension and connecting in with the mycelial net. We happen to be closer in genetic structure to mushrooms than we are to plants. In fact, the whole animal species is a wing off of the mycelial network species. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but this aspect of connecting and releasing tension and improving our health is probably the number one thing I would prescribe our world. Why? Because we have, I'd say the number one disease of our time is actually nature deficit disorder. That's right, a deficit of connecting in with the wood wide web. As a species, we're actually lonely. One of our biggest sufferings is mental illness, and it comes from this lack of ability to recommunicate. Every other species on our planet has this neural net built into them, and they're connected into this network. So forest bathing is one thing. The other thing that I like to share is that no matter where you come at 
looking at biohacking, where you come at looking at health and optimizing the human species, all fish swim upstream. And this is a universal truth. You may start looking at extracts and the chemical compounds that are found in different plants, things that are found in your bodies, looking at your dopamine levels, looking at optimizing your health, but eventually you start moving into how can the natural world support us? Getting into these teas, tinctures, whole plants, plants, Eventually, the best biohack that I know of is that source connection, and that is being out in the natural world. So that's what I'm most passionate about, and that's what I want to share with you today. How do we take this chain and swim upstream? So we might start, we sell a lot of tinctures, teas, powders, but really getting out and connecting in with these species is the primary place we can get that source code connection. So meditation, spending time in the forest, resetting our rhythm, slowing down, getting out of the beta wave into this kind of theta gamma wave where we actually pull in that source code. All right, so what are mushrooms? They are a macro fungi. Many of you know of seaweeds as a macro algae and spirulina and chlorella as a micro algae. Well, fungi is a whole kingdom and there are a lot of them. Mushrooms are ones that produce fruits, similar to this one right here. And like I was saying, we share up to 67% of the same DNA. Most plants share about 25% of the same DNA. This is a key important aspect because these mushrooms produce chemical compounds that help them as the best strategy for being on this planet to deal with the pathogenic organisms of planet Earth. So they are antiviral, antifungal, antimicrobial, antipathogenic, many of them antiparasitic. That's right, antifungal funguses. So many of these medicinal mushrooms you'll see on up here are these tree conchs. These have these antimicrobial, antipathogenic functions because they need to strategize this to save their own lives. All right, so this is the fruiting, this is the cycle of a mushroom. Essentially, they, um, in the hypha, they produce in the spore pads right in here, they produce all their spores. And this is where all this beauty happens. Many of the chemical compounds we find in the medicinal mushrooms are found in these spore pads. So there's a couple of different ways in which people are extracting them. Some are using the mycelium directly. Let's see if we got a laser. Some are doing just this mycelium, but essentially the fruiting body is where most of the concentrated chemistry comes. And like I said in this slide, it's a beautiful process. This love making that happens basically right here, as these expand, they network and create this kind of network inside and they reproduce in this kind of tandem, almost like a kundalini experience. This is how mushrooms make love. Where are they found? These things are everywhere. Literally, right now in this conference, if you stay here all day, you'll have breathed in more than a billion mushroom spores. Probably there's about 150, even though we're in a fairly sterile building, underground, deep in the netherverse of planet Earth, there's probably a few hundred species of spores in the air right now. They're all the way to the stratosphere and up to a mile below the Earth. So if we screw this planet up, shame on us. If we take out biodiversity, shame on us. But these guys, oops, I'll go back. These guys right here, they're here to bioremediate and heal this planet. They are the immune system of this planet. They are the neural bio network of this planet. And they're here from way before us and will be here way longer than us. So they'll, they'll heal this planet no matter what happens. About a quarter of the biomass is made up of mycelial networks. And about, uh, I think it's about 23 to 35% is made up of bacteria. Between these two communities, the fungal community and the bacterial community, they make up most of life on this planet. And the thing that we can learn about them is how they share. They share transparently and completely with each other. So they've adapted to be in a share economy, a connection economy. This is something that we can learn a lot from in how we share ourselves. How do we create value, right? Many of us hold back our information in order to create proprietary results, but really, the evolution of the human species is about creating value, more value than you require, and therefore sharing infinitely and abundantly so that others can benefit and grow that as well. That's human evolution, that's where we're going. So they've been here since way before on land up to 2.4 billion years ago. Plants have only been on land for 700 million years. What is that? These mycelial networks were breaking down the lava rock, literally pulling out all this nutrition, building subsoils so they could actually end up building forests. This is 
the reality of planet Earth. This planet Earth was sculpted by mycelial networks to create the ecosystems we all enjoy now. So they have this deeper wisdom of intelligence that I think we can tap into. Largest organism on this planet is a honey mushroom. And this thing is massive, but it's not the only one. There's plenty of other large mushrooms that are old, you know, wisdom. We're talking real wisdom on this planet. Many of our trees that are the elders, the old growth trees, we come to these places where the trees are to really reconnect back in with what it is to be on planet Earth. And these mycelial networks were here way before the forests. So many of them know every species in the forest. They're tapped into many of the different species in the forest. And when you walk on the soil anywhere on this planet, the mycelium hear you. They feel your presence. All right. So we can, we can turn this into food. This is something we do. It's called free the mushroom log inoculation classes. And literally, we can take mushroom spores in this like uh, grain spawn, inoculate them into wood, drill them into logs, take the logs, put in the mushroom spores, and then seal them up with wax. This will create a food forest. This is the fastest way to feed people. The most cost-effective way we can feed people is using, this is an oyster mushroom, literally two years old, it's flushing. It'll turn that 10 pound or six pound log into about two thirds of its weight or more in mushrooms. They're also the best bioremediators. And I didn't put a slide up on bioremediation, but the amount of science now coming out around bioremediation and pulling out oil and diesel out of toxic environments. Even when you go to Chernobyl, there's, my, there's mushrooms growing on the walls, slime molds growing on the walls in Chernobyl right now, bioremediating out the radiation. They're here to heal this planet and they're not gonna let us take it down. I love picking mushrooms. This is probably my favorite, favorite thing to do. Right now is mushroom season all through here. If you get a chance to get out into any, even to, to Toronto Island or any of the parkways outside of here, you're gonna start seeing a lot of these mushroom species. Probably one of the best ones that's around here is this black trumpet, love that one. You also got some chanterelles and these winter chanterelles. Pine mushrooms, the matsutake is the favorite in Japan. This is, this mushroom was worth $18 a mushroom at one point. Very, 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 expensive mushroom now, has a beautiful cinnamon aroma and just is, oh. But these puffballs, you probably see these even in the parkways here. Now I'm not saying you should eat them out of the parks in Toronto. God knows what's in those parks. These are bioremediators and they're probably pulling out some of the toxins there, but they are a choice edible. Anyway, some more wild mushrooms. This is food for the masses. Probably my favorite, I harvested a couple of these this year, these King Belites. In Europe, they have a whole group of people called bolitivores. They eat and love these porcinis and bolites, but even these shaggy manes are pretty tasty. The other thing I love about the shaggy manes is you can turn them into ink. They're also known as inky caps, and you can start making writing ink with them. Favorite mushrooms of mine are cauliflower, has a beautiful flavor. This honey mushroom is super abundant. Chicken of the woods is delicious, and the bear's tooth is related to one of our medicinals we're gonna talk about in a minute the lion's mane. This is the hericium family that has the neurogenic properties that are gonna really support the body. But anyway, eating wild mushrooms, probably one of my favorite things to do. This will connect you just if you get out and do mushroom foraging. I know a lot of us have mycophobia and we don't know what's good. My recommendation is find five or six species you can actually identify. Really easy to see the morels, really easy to find the chicken of the woods, very hard to miss, distinguish that, or this cauliflower, or if we go back, these puff balls, if you cut them open and they're clear puff, they're easy. Lobster mushrooms are very easy to find. So there's many of these we can start getting out and connecting with, but this is me harvesting one day of chanterelles and it's amazing the food we can create out of this. One thing about nutrition, and I know we had an amazing speaker on ketogenics, we've had a few different speakers on nutrition. I just wanna give you guys a brain hook, an idea for a diet. I live what I call the flexitarian diet, which is 80% awesome upgrade of what I know right now to be the best hack, the best nutrition on the planet, and 20% zero guilt. That's right, 20% zero guilt. What that is is if I'm shaming myself over I can't eat this, can't eat that, can't eat this, I'm not doing myself a service. The beauty of eating a wild diet and getting into the wild, even just like 2% of your diet getting wild nutrition is you're actually picking up 
on a much more important ingredient that many of us lack, and that is true levity. I have energy coming out the wazoo. Why? Because I have levity flowing through me, the opposite of gravity. In fact, you are all levity beings. So my diet is eat levity. Eat the food that has the most levity in it. What has the most stored abundant energy? What is upward moving and defying this world's gravity? The yin to the yang. That's what I believe to eat. And so the spirit found in wild foods is very high in chi, very high in energy, very high in levity. I know it's simple, but this is, this is what I believe in as the best diet, is to find the levity. So it doesn't matter what kind of foods you eat, if it's processed, if it's canned, if it's frozen, it's losing its levity, it's losing its chi. Look to the attention of where the plant holds that energy, and that's where we wanna find our nutrition. All right, so we're gonna talk about the levity eaters. These are the top levity eaters on our planet, the ennobled species of the mushroom kingdom. They are the tree-loving polypores. Why do I call them the levity eaters? Because guess who eats the most, who is the most levity on this planet? It's the trees. They pump blood 60 to 100 feet in the air. They are continually pushing this levity up, moving it up. And what these mushrooms do is they transform that into a much more potent aspect of that. So they take out all the plant fibers, they're living in the underground mycelial networks, and they produce these fruiting bodies. And these tree-eating polypores are the ennobled species of our planet. That's right, they're like the dolphins and the whales of the mammals. Maybe humans, we might fit in there somewhere, but definitely the ennobled species are the dolphins and the whales. Maybe gorillas. <laughs> um, what we find in these mushrooms is that they concentrate really unique chemistry in their spore pads and all through their bodies. They produce something called branch polysaccharides. And we're gonna go there, we're gonna get there. These branch polysaccharides and these beta-glucans are literally what I would call Aztec glyph-like molecules. They're macro carbon or carbohydrates. Now we talked about, I heard earlier in the slides, about sugar, right? Sugar, ooh, I call it the number one street drug on our planet. We're addicted to sugar. Actually, all life is addicted to cash flow, to value. Sugar is essentially value. It's, it's instant energy. We produce it in our body, we create it based on our energy reserves. But what these guys do is they concentrate carbon chains and create these macrocarbons, which are much more potent. These are like, if we took every chair in this audience and considered each one a full length carbon chain, it would still only be like a quarter of the size of one of these polycarbons. They're Aztec glyph-like structures. They'd be as many chairs as in the Toronto Leafs Stadium over there. So they're these macromolecules, but they're really simple. What's interesting about them is they're just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, times a thousand. And what we've learned and what we're learning more and more about the actual organic chemistry is it's not so much about the individual elements, it's actually about the shape of the chemistry. And everything we see in organic chemistry is all about how the shape fits together. This is how our body picks up knowledge. We learn from the shapes, we learn from the degrees and angles and branching of the chemical compounds we put into the body. So my belief is that your job as a upgrading person is to catalog the world, to expose yourself to a wide range of shapes so you can get a college education in how to show up on this planet. We can come up with all the diets we want and guess what? This planet is gonna, they're gonna keep going up, down, up, down. Catalog the world, educate your body. Give yourself a higher education in being on planet Earth and part of that comes from these branch polysaccharides. That's really how they work. There are these macromolecules that our body can cut up and use as weaponry for our immune system, that can help stabilize our microbiome and build up better soils inside of us and heal this whole, and this whole system. So we call them biological response modifiers. They're immunomodulants. What is that? If I got a low immune system, it's gonna bring me up. If I got a high immune system, AKA autoimmune, the Crohn's, the fibromyalgia, the, the uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it's gonna help bring that heightened immune response back down. Essentially, a college education in how to show up as a balanced being on planet Earth. And we find these in all of these medicinal mushrooms. 
They also end up having an anti-tumor and anti-pathogenic response because what they do is they recognize or they help the body's immune system work in symbiosis in entire intactity so they can see where are these tumors, what are these pathogens, what are these allergens, and how is this body out of balance? So many of these are, are stabilizers. In fact, chaga, drinking chaga tea, is one of the best blood sugar stabilizers I know of. Just drink it on a regular basis. It's a, it'll help stabilize the blood sugars. Now, beyond this and uh, these branched polysaccharides, there's other, this other chemistry in them. We'll go over here this time. Triterpenes, kind of get you looking at both sides. Because um, you want to use both sides of your brain, right? The triterpenes are found in these spore pads. They're found in the spores. And there's a number of different terpene and hormonal type groups. This is the sexual reproductive aspect of this mushroom. And I'll tell you one thing about sex, it's everything. All life is about sex. And all chemistry is gearing, much of the chemistry in, in the human body, in the plant world, in the fungal world, is gearing towards reproduction. So the best chemistry is usually found in the reproductive organs, in the reproductive systems, whether it's the seeds, the flowers, or the mycelial spore pads. And this is where we really see a lot of activity happening in these triterpene groups, where we have more of these immunomodulators, these liver protective agents, much of this antiviral and anti-tumor and antioxidant effects are found in these. In chaga, which isn't a true fruiting body, it's a sclerotia, we see it on the black part. But in many of the other ones, it's in the spore pads. That's where we see these terpene groups. And they're not water soluble. Unfortunately, they're only alcohol soluble. So we need to make what's called a dual extraction if we're gonna start to work with medicinal mushrooms. That means decoctions, right? We can do the double, double boil and trouble method of breaking down the lignans and the chitin inside of the mushrooms to extract them and get the best chemistry out of them. This is what we do with these branched polysaccharides. But then to get the terpene groups, we need to make an alcohol extraction with them. Put the two together and you make your dual extracted tincture. This is some of what we have to share, but favorites of mine are really this dual extracted powder, which is taking a tincture and reducing it down to a powder that's easily added to your coffee, added to your smoothie, added to your tea, or even put in your oatmeal. All right. So these are some of the forms that we like to work with mushrooms in. Dual extracted tinctures, dual extracted powders, and making a tea cut. Very simply, there's many different ways we can work with them. We also like to work with syrups. We put them in elixirs. We make these hot tonic drinks, which I think is the kind of ultimate upgrade for the human, especially in North America, in the northern parts of the world where it's cold. We want to have a nice warm, instead of a smoothie, we're going to want to upgrade that to a hot tonic drink. And I'll be serving those up at our booth a little later. But essentially, these dual extracted mushroom powders go through this whole process where we're extracting them in alcohol, we're extracting them in water, and we're bringing it down through a vacuum tube dehydrator extraction method, which is something that we use in uh, a lot of juice powders to make this. This is the easiest upgrade that I know of for working with medicinal mushrooms. So I wanna talk to you about a few individual mushrooms now. This is my wife, me out on our Easter egg hunt. We call this our Easter egg hunt, hunting down the wild reishi. And there's two ways that this affects us. One, getting into that forest, sinking back into a slower biorhythm versus being in the city and ready, fire, aim all the time, brings down our energy. And that in itself is helpful. But the byline for this mushroom and why we're out to see it is to protect the academic from their own mind, to protect us from circular thinking, from anxiety, from overstimulation, from that ready, fire, aim. So this helps benefit us when it comes to things like attention deficit, when it comes to things like asthma, when it comes to things like anxiety. Many of our neurological conditions, we end up with shallow breathing, or we end up with out of our body. So reishi, this is this mushroom of, that I'm holding right here. They call it the mushroom of immortality in China. This is the true longevity tonic. If you go to the, to the forbidden city in China, the emperor's throne has a giant golden reishi on it. 4,000 years of written history. They've been documenting using this mushroom and more money has been spent studying this mushroom than any other natural substance on the planet. We're talking about 120 of these different terpene groups and 400 of these branched polysaccharides we find in it. And it's not just for grounding and not just for calming down the body, but it also, has a lot of these antipathogenic effects 
and it's protective for the liver. In fact, using this with people who have gone through radiation toxicity has a huge dramatic effect in supporting their body. We also find especially that asthma and allergies and heart palpitations. These are some of the areas that reishi really helps ground us in and bring us back into our body. So meditation in a bottle. A lot of us could use a bit of reishi, but I like to combine it with many of the other mushrooms. So that one was, this one's considered the queen, supposedly, and this one, the king, I'm not sure. That one's a little more phallic looking, and that one's a little more feminine. So we'll see where that goes. But considering this the king of the mushrooms, that's the chaga mushroom. I've got a piece right here. This grows on our birch trees. And the interesting piece of that is that this actually, you see in this little thing, the birch right there, the, this actually, holds longevity for the birch trees. How it works is it's the immune system of the birch forest. And when a branch falls off of a tree, this will grow in and support the health of that tree. Not always, but often. And that tree that has chug on it will live quite a bit longer than any of the other trees that don't. So this actually works as an immune response because this tree is a short-lived tree. Anyway, it concentrates the betulinic acid in the outer layer, and we see some of the most antioxidant potential of anything on this planet. There's a scale called the ORAC scale where we measure antioxidants. And in case you don't know, you're just like a car. You rust, you oxidize. Every single cell that oxidizes has to reproduce. And the way, this is maybe a, a kind of a metaphor for this, but the way that these cells reproduce is just like a photocopy machine. They get grainier and grainier and grainier every time they reproduce. So essentially, if you wanna live a long time, antioxidants are one of the most important things you can do for your body. This has one called SOD, or superoxide dismutase. This is a free radical scavenger that your major organ systems are already set up and using. They know this is one of the best badass free radical scavengers to protect them and heal the gut, heal the internal organs so that they don't oxidize as fast. So that's one of the things that's in chaga, and they put it on that ORAC scale, and it was through the roof. Higher than anything we've ever found was this mushroom. So that kind of blew science out. They're like, whoa, what is this stuff? How does this work? You simmer it up like a tea, really gentle, really tasty. It's been used in the Siberian tundra for a long time as a gentle tonic. Even when I went to Finland, they're all over the chaga. It's definitely one of those Ones that also has some antiviral and some cholesterol supporting, helping to lower the LDLs, and it's got some blood sugar stabilizing qualities, like I mentioned before. So that's a great mushroom. This one, whoa, you wanna have some fun? Google tarantula cordyceps. You'll get this tarantula with all these crazy mushrooms growing out of it. Ant cordyceps, any bug, insect, this mushroom, many different varieties of cordyceps, grow on. So we've got some back there, some wild cordyceps, and I'm gonna put you to this slide next. Whoa, look at those things. Those are gnarly. These are different bugs, mostly ghost moths, that are grown with cordyceps growing out of them, found wild in South America. This mushroom ha was originally found in the high plateaus. So in the Himalayas, we see this cordyceps growing on a silkworm. And what we find about the cordyceps on the silkworm is that it has this anti, um, when we're, we're up in the, the altitude sickness, so it helps with altitude sickness, anti-altitude, helping us breathe better. In fact, cordyceps opens up the bore in the lungs and gives you a much deeper oxygen flow into the body. So many athletes are using this. In fact, we've got a, a number of uh, Calgary Stampeders and the Edmonton Eskimos in Calgary and Edmonton working with this wild cordyceps to help increase their activity when it comes to being on the field. Giving them much better blood flow, preventing lactic acid buildup in the muscles, so people who are doing workouts, this is a great one to help support them. But also the main thing that I like about it is it's adrenal support. And it's a little bit of a libido. I know it looks gnarly, especially these ones. Those are pretty gnarly looking, but it's got a little bit of a bring me back into my body, bring me more presence, give me adrenal support. So this one in Chinese medicine is what they call a Jing tonic, which is to, to support, there's something they have called three treasures. You have your Qi, which is your active energy, you have your Xian, which is your spirit, and you have your Jing, which is the ancestral energy you come into life with. This supports rebuilding your Jing. We're looking at longevity here. Biohacking is about human optimization. Rebuilding the Jing, the Jing treasure in the Chinese medicine system, will increase your Xian, which will make your spirit glow that much more and help your longevity. All right, 
So next up, we've got turkey tail. Love this mushroom. This is the one, I call it hiker's mushroom because it's all through the forest here. You will find these little turkey tails growing on logs all through the forest. This mushroom made a huge a breakthrough in Japan and in China when they started studying it, second most heavily studied mushroom on the world. It's got a chemical in it called PSK or polysaccharide crestine. This is one of those giant Aztec glyph branch polysaccharides. Well, they put this up with people doing chemo and radiation therapy, and they had up to 400 times better recovery rate from the radiation therapy and huge anti-cancer properties. So this mushroom is now prescribed in China and in, well, really in Japan, it's in their basic version of the pharmacopoeia and their FDA approval to be used in conjunction with, keto with, with any of the chemotherapies. That's huge. It's also given to patients freely. So in the 80s when this first happened, and I'm talking 30 plus years ago, this was recognized by their version of the allopathic system to be a beneficial medicine. It's shot off through the roof all through Asia as the most predominant thing to work with cancer treatment. All right. We've also, back on that actually for a second, we've got some really positive and powerful antiviral and liver protective properties in this. When in doubt, treat the liver. It's my, my belief, and many of the herbalists that I know, it's treat the liver. The liver is our great alchemist in the body. It's what moves and heals our body. So the blood is purified in the liver every single night. Treat the liver. When in doubt, work on the digestive system, the hole in your donut, your toroidal field generator, and treat the liver. Like a sponge, every spring I wring out my liver using medicinal mushrooms and all kinds of other liver supportive herbs. Lion's mane. I like to joke that this is the one I can't remember what it's good for. You guys know why? Because it's good for memory. <laughs> nerve cell, nerve growth factor is the big thing in lion's mane. This one's gaining a lot of fame. It actually made its way into Forbes magazine not too long ago as a, as a biohack for optimizing performance by high level professionals. It, as a way for CEOs to really dial into remembering things, to connecting back into their cognitive function. We're seeing this, most of the science came out around multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's and neurodegenerative diseases. This is where lion's mane really shines. But I've had people come up to me who have been in car accidents and have lost major amounts of their brain function and have regained and regrown nerve cells through using this mushroom. So it makes you feel good. It's good for depression, anxiety, nervous tension. I find this one with the reishi together is that real protector for our biggest disease of our time, which is that mental illness and separation from the natural world. So anyway, there's many other mushrooms. I don't have as much time to talk to you about them, but red belted polypore is one of my favorite from the West Coast. We use this for all kinds of tonics. The Ganoderma aplanatum is a artist conch from our all through the forest here. This is one of our North American reishis. The gorillas used to love to eat this mushroom. They prize this mushroom. And one thing I really did want to share with you is that in one minute, one minute, this mushroom releases 21 million spores, 30 billion a day, and five trillion a year. One fruiting body of this mushroom reaches, releases enough spores to produce, if they all grew to full size, to produce, this is in one season, to produce a mass three times the size of our, of our sun. If our planet was a golf ball, if our sun was a basketball, this mushroom has enough life in it to produce a mass the size of a giant beach volleyball, so, or a giant beach ball. Anyway, powerful, powerful medicine. These mushrooms have a lot to heal us. So that's it. Maybe you know Otzi. First place we know about medicinal mushrooms comes from Otzi the Iceman. He was carrying many of these mushrooms on him. And we found out, yeah, you know what? Lyme's, oops, that's me. Lyme's disease, Lyme disease, was a thing back then. And Otzi was lactose intolerant. Can you believe that? He carried a birch polypore and a tinder conch on him as a way to deal with his pathogens and his parasites and his Lyme. This has been used for a long time. These are ageless medicines that carry the wisdom of our planet. So please, I invite you to connect deeper with mycelium networks and to learn more about the intelligence of our planet if you want to align with the optimal health for your body. All right. 
Thank you for joining me. You can find me, Herbal Jedi, on our YouTube channel. We have about 150 videos on plant medicine and about a few dozen on medicinal mushrooms. So please check us out there. Our booth is over here, Harmonic Arts, and we have Wild Rose College. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.